Good afternoon. I'm Neil Quilliam. I'm the acting head of the Middle East and North Africa program here at Chatham House. I'm delighted to welcome you all this afternoon to the launch of our Chatham House report, Future Trends in the Gulf. Um, you should have one on your chairs or should be in your hands at the moment. Uh, it's a very grand looking report and definitely worth um, a very good read. Just a couple of uh, notices before we kick off. The, um, our event is going to be on the record. The event will also be live streamed and people can comment via Twitter using hashtag CH events. If I could ask you all to put your phones on silent mode, that will help us enormously. We've got about 53 minutes, um, so we don't have a lot of time, so I won't talk too much. I'll sort of cut straight to the chase, get on with our speakers. We have Jane Kinnamont with us this afternoon, who's going to speak for 15 minutes. She will be well known to all of you. She is a, um, she is a deputy head of the Middle East North Africa program here. She's a senior research fellow. She is a prolific author. Um, it seems just about six weeks ago we were launching her Bahrain report, and here we are a little bit later launching this, this major report. So her contribution to um, Middle East policy, I think, is enormous and will be appreciated by all of you. Um, to my left, we have Elizabeth uh, Dickinson, who is based in the Arabian Peninsula, is a journalist, writes for the New York Times, Christian Science Monitor, and lots of other, the Financial Times and lots of other publications. I wanted just to point out one thing, which I think is fabulous about you, is that she's the author of the Kindle single, Who Shot Ahmed, which is a true life murder mystery of a 22-year-old videographer. Um, so that's really quite interesting. And then to my extended left is Khaled al Mazani, who is assistant professor at Qatar University, where he teaches international relations of the Gulf states and security in the Gulf. Um, he and I share um, part of our history together because we're both at U University of Exeter at very different times. You got your PhD from there. And Khalid's book, The Politics of Aid, Foreign Aid Programs of Arab Gulf States, will be coming out soon. So we've got three really good speakers, very well qualified to be talking on these issues. Um, Jane, without sort of talking too much, I'm going to hand over to you. And you've got 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. This report, Future Trends in the GCC Countries, analyzes the dynamics of change in countries that are often seen in the West of being bastions of stability, especially at a time of conflict and state failure in some of the countries around them. The report argues that the six Gulf monarchies are undergoing very profound change when it comes to the structure of their economies, the structure of their populations, the availability of information and education compared to the previous generation, and the, their interconnectedness with the rest of the world through globalization. These changes also imply changes at the political level, and we've seen even at a time of plenty over the last decade, rising political mobilization in the Gulf countries, although to very different degrees and in very different ways in different places. But, but the changes in political mobilization and political expectations have been largely unmatched by changes at the level of formal politics. The report argues that the Gulf countries should seize the opportunity that they have for consensus-based political development towards more constitutional forms of monarchy. Despite the attention that we often pay to the violent minority in the Gulf and in the region as a whole, it is a tiny proportion of the population that supports and sympathizes with groups such as the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda. The Gulf countries have a very positive opportunity that in most cases, the mainstream opposition movements are not seeking revolution. They are seeking more accountable and responsive government. And in many cases, traditionally marginalized groups are seeking more of a say. It is possible to accommodate some of these demands in a, a, a peaceful way. 
However, I will argue that those opportunities are being squandered, that peaceful, moderate oppositionists are all too often being repressed. The report does not take the view that the Gulf countries are extremely vulnerable to successful revolutions and regime change. They have many factors that do support regime security, including extensive international backing. However, if we do see more revolutionary movements arising in the years ahead, we could see a much more conflictual pattern of politics, societal conflict and sectarian tensions in the years ahead, leading to instability in an area that is obviously of vital strategic importance for the rest of the world. The report goes through chapter by chapter different areas in which the Gulf is changing and it starts by looking at the changes in the Gulf economies. The, the relations between citizens and states in the Gulf have been shaped by the oil economy that the Gulf states developed in the 20th century. And most of the Gulf states became independent within the last five decades. The, the nature of the post-independent government and their relationships with their peoples were profoundly affected by the oil boom of the 1970s and the ability of the states to provide largesse to their citizens. But in the medium to long term, the revenues from energy resources are not sufficient to sustain the current political economic bargain. Despite diversification efforts over recent years, oil still represents the vast majority, 85 to 90 percent of export revenues and crucially of government budgets in most of the Gulf countries. And in four of the six GCC states, hydrocarbons resources will run out within the lifetimes of citizens born today. Of course, such, success, such concerns are being emphasised by the recent fall in the oil price. I'll note the report was first drafted before that happens, and most of the analysis on the economy is looking at a more structural level as prices are always volatile. But even if oil prices recover to $100 a barrel, three of the six GCC countries already need that level of oil price in order to balance their budgets. And crucially, these break-even prices are rising every year as population growth adds to the public sector wage and subsidy bills. Public sector wages typically account for 10% of GDP in the Gulf countries, except the UAE and Qatar, which are very small citizen populations. The urgency and the time scale of these economic challenges varies from country to country. It's most pronounced in Oman and in Bahrain, the least oil rich of the Gulf countries. Clearly, it's no coincidence that those were the countries that saw the greatest unrest at the time of the Arab uprisings. But even in the wealthier countries, there are very tough choices to be made about the allocation of resources and future, about diversification efforts, about whether the countries seek to pursue private sector opportunities that will provide jobs for nationals, which has traditionally been a function of the states, or whether they will go with the interests of the business elite in growing sectors that largely uh, provide jobs for non-nationals. Uh, although there's a, a growing sense of unease among some in the Gulf at having the world's highest rates of inward migration. All of the Gulf countries have extensive strategic economic visions for diversifying their economies away from oil, for developing a wider range of sectors, boosting their trade links with non-traditional partners and seeking to boost education and develop knowledge economies. But there have been two major shortcomings when it comes to these economic policies. The first, crucially, is that these long-term strategic plans are unmatched by similar strategic thinking about the political implications of these profound changes in the role of the state. And secondly, because the political risk and political costs haven't been fully factored in, the Gulf countries have tended to put these plans on the back burner or in the drawer at times of threatened potential mass social unrest. So what we've seen since 2011 is that in the year of the Arab uprisings, the Gulf countries 
despite their, their stated intentions to generally roll back the role of the state in the economy, made new public spending commitments worth $150 billion, or 13% of GDP. While their stated objectives tend to be to promote private sector employment and get nationals from the public sector into the private sector, in 2011, they created tens of thousands of new public sector jobs, many of them being in the security forces. And where elected parliaments exist, they have pushed for such populist economic measures because usually this is the only power that they have. But it's something that's not sustainable. And the report argues that Gulf governments need to work more with parliaments and with publics to reach a new political economic pact in the years ahead. Like the rest of the Middle East, the Gulf countries have largely youthful populations. Most of the populations are under 30. And the availability of education and information from all over the world to this generation is radically different than it has ever been for previous generations. The states have always tried to monopolize information, especially the broadcast media. In the 50s and 60s, they were worried by the spread of pan-Arab radio stations, especially coming from Nasser's Cairo. But today, the ability to control the media has completely altered. Famously, Saudis are the, the highest users of, of YouTube in the world. Uh, Twitter, Kick, and other social media platforms, WhatsApp, are, are used by, by everybody. And just to try to put into perspective what a seismic change it is, Saudi citizens couldn't actually access the internet until 1999. And as recently as 10 years ago, while broadband was available in the kingdom, it was available only through Saudi Telecom, which provided it to around 1% of Saudi households. When camera phones were invented, they were initially banned in Saudi Arabia. But today, Saudi, like the other Gulf countries, has one of the highest rates of mobile phone penetration in the world. Everybody is able to access a hugely diverse range of information um, in their pockets. And these sort of traditional attempts to control the flow of ideas are no longer working. What's particularly important also about the social media is that it's not just about access to information and consumption of ideas, but it's an interface which encourages people to be participants and you see, for instance, it may be very conservative people sometimes that are empowered by social media. Some of the, the most popular accounts in the region are religious clerics, but they're now interacting with people on a more level platform where people can respond to them, sometimes very rudely, interact with them in a very different way. I'm not making a kind of cyber optimism argument here because, of course, a lot of the information is of poor quality. Often sectarian, ethnic and political tensions are exacerbated by short form anonymous internet debates. And in almost every Gulf country, there have been young people locked up for things they've said on Twitter, whether they've been political or whether they've been things that have been almost silly or jokes. Insulting the ruler is something that's a criminal offence across the Gulf. And since 2011, while some Gulf officials have sought to engage with the public on Twitter, there have also been a lot of new legislation passed to criminalise mocking or, or satirising anything that could be seen to, to represent the state. In terms of political mobilisation, it's a very diverse scene across the Gulf. The protests in Bahrain are well known, those in Oman perhaps less so. But something I think as Western observers we often miss is the important petition movements that have taken place, especially in Saudi Arabia and also on a smaller scale in the United Arab Emirates. There's a strong local tradition in the Gulf of petitioning rulers with demands for change. A variety of petitions have emerged with support from Islamists and liberals, sometimes working together, seeking more accountable governments, more transparent and independent judiciaries, and essentially more checks on the power of ruling family. We don't tend to see much of them in the media, but they represent some of the important changes that are taking place under the, uh, under the surface. For the most part, the response to the political mobilisation that we've seen taking place has either been by the governments to solve political problems with economic means, 
spending more money, sometimes seeking to address serious problems of service delivery, waste and corruption. And secondly, the other key response has been repression from trying to legitimise critics and opposition movements as foreign agents or as extremists to pure coercion, imprisoning peaceful activists, lawyers, human rights campaigners and so forth. There are always also elements of reform. Usually they are, this, this is the strategy that is used the least, but there is a tradition in the Gulf of trying to accommodate demands from new social groups. Often reforms are used as a fig leaf. They're used to a very limited extent uh, and they, they, they may be very cosmetic, but there are some opportunities that could be built upon. The report has various recommendations for both Gulf governments and their Western allies when it comes to managing political change and political development. And I'll highlight a few of them here. They're detailed, of course, much more in the report. The Gulf governments need to accompany their long-term economic diversification schemes with serious plans for long-term political diversification to manage the impact of political shifts in the economic role of the state and to share the burden with parliaments and representatives of the public. Stronger, more transparent institutions, parliaments, judiciaries and ministries with a greater meritocratic element should be developed to manage the competing interest that always exists in any society, but which may face more intense competition as resources shrink. To make such institutions function and to make a reality of the claims that Gulf countries have traditions of consultation with the public, peaceful opposition activities from calling for constitutional monarchy or parliamentary elections to simple criticism of government policies should be decriminalised. Transparency and openness in governance should be accorded a higher priority because the demands for those are clear. And ensuring social, economic and political inclusion should be prioritised as the most important counterweight to the pull of sectarian, ethnic or other forms of transnational identities. We can talk more about this in the discussion. Ultimately, for political reforms to be serious and meaningful, this means that the ruling families would need to prepare their own younger generations to have a different role in which they wield less power over the political system and over the economy. Just as they need to raise awareness among their citizens of the long-term unwinding of the oil-based economic bargain, they too need to accept that this will change their own position. And this is perhaps a sensitive subject to touch upon, but if institutional level reforms, legal changes or constitutional changes are to be meaningful, ultimately they would need to be also accompanied by reforms at the, the level of these deep informal institutions, the ruling establishments. In terms of the implications for Western governments, the report isn't calling on Westerners to try to force democratic values upon the Gulf. Rather, it's arguing that change should and will come largely from within, although always in conversation with a larger world. But as an outside observer, I can see changes that, that make it very clear that in the years ahead, the Gulf governments will need to negotiate some different arrangements with their citizens. And, Gulf, and Western countries need to think hard about the implications that has for their own relations, which are mainly with the elites, and how they can diversify the base of their relations with the Gulf beyond the existing elite to take, uh, to, to relate more to public opinion, even though public opinion may be fragmented and difficult to read. One of the recommendations is that defence cooperation with the Gulf needs to be placed in a wider political context where the issue of citizens' rights is not seen as a nice to have that human rights specialists can deal with, but that isn't relevant to the serious business of defence and security. Rather, the relations between citizens and states in the Gulf is going to be a fundamental part of the, the ongoing internal security of these countries. 
economic engagement needs to be oriented more towards education and diversification, the key things that the people in the Gulf need. Countries seeking sustainable partnerships and companies who want a long-term presence in the Gulf need to demonstrate the ability to add real value to sectors of clear public benefit, healthcare, education, affordable housing, resource sustainability and cultural industries. These will have wider public appeal than the traditional focus of defence, finance and energy, which create few local jobs. Counter-terrorism cooperation will probably be an increasingly important part of relations in the coming years with the Islamic State, unlikely to be disappearing anytime soon. But also in this regard, it's really essential for Western policymakers to listen to local public opinion. Gulf populations in general want more weight to be given to protecting people in their region, especially Iraqis, Syrians and Palestinians from state violence and refugeehood, as well as terrorist groups. And when looking at Gulf security, Westerners also need to think about the need for Gulf citizens to feel secure from their own governments. For instance, by ensuring that the police are held accountable and ending lengthy detention without trial. Finally, the Gulf does need to be placed in the context of relations with the wider Middle East. Currently, many of the traditional powers in the Middle East are in internal disarray. And the Gulf countries are some of the older and more familiar friends for British and American policymakers in particular. But it is worth recalling that the citizens of the Gulf states comprise less than 10% of the Arab world's populations. And strategy towards these countries needs to form part of a wider strategy towards what is increasingly a politically diverse region. Thank you very much. I look forward to discussing this with you. Thank you very much, Jane. You've obviously summarised the, you know, the key messages in the report, and I should say that the report is a culmination of a three-year project that you've been leading, so it's, uh, it's very dense and very rich in content. Before I turn to Elizabeth and Khaled with a question, or to get their feedback, I'd actually like to put a question to you. And that would be, you, know, you, you talk about significant political change coming in the Gulf. Why now? Um, older hands in the audience might have said, well, we heard these sort of clarion calls maybe in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. What's changed to actually make, you know, make us believe that this change is coming now? The Gulf has undergone a variety of periods of change. So the regimes have been resilient, but they have not been static. Uh, the model of monarchy has changed. The Gulf countries took advantage quite successfully of the British imperial presence in the Gulf to solidify their rule at that time. At the time of independence, some of them went for very different strategies. It's very important to be aware that the most powerful parliaments the Gulf has ever had were introduced after the withdrawal of Britain from the Gulf in, in Kuwait and in Bahrain. The oil boom allowed them to change their direction again. Uh, parliament in Bahrain, for instance, was abolished. They became much more focused on the economic bargain. So the report isn't arguing that it is the end of the road for the Gulf monarchies, but that this is another time that the game is changing, that they need to adapt. Traditionally, they've been good at adapting, but there might be a risk that at a time when they are very, very wealthy and they're being courted by allies and would, you know, people who want their investment from all around the world, that they might be at a risk of some complacency about the need to negotiate with their own populations. Thank you. Elizabeth, if we could turn to you and just, if I could give you five minutes just to just get your comments on, on Jane's uh, main points now. Thank you, and um, thanks again for having me. It's such an honor to uh, speak on this, in, this really uh, um, incredible and important report. Um, I, I think I would just raise two points from the report that I found particularly striking to me as a journalist working in the region. Um, I think, in, at least in my own industry, and I think more broadly when we think about the Gulf, it's very easy to break the Middle East into sort of two sections. There's the part that's on fire and there's the part that's putting out the fire. And I think the point that I really appreciated from the report was talking about how the Gulf fits into the context of the Middle East because this is something that I've seen over and over again and I think it's a very underappreciated um, an important and changing dynamic within the Gulf countries. Uh, just the extent of their relationship with the rest of the Middle East, the extent of their influence, and frankly, the extent to which the events in the wider Middle East 
ripple back and have impacts on the Gulf states themselves. So we see this, you know, today we cannot talk about, for example, the situation in Egypt without talking about uh, the support that Egypt receives from the Gulf states. We cannot talk about the crisis in Syria without talking about the very real political influence that states like Qatar, Saudi Arabia, the UAE have. We cannot talk about the crisis in Libya without talking about the UAE and Qatar. These are very real situations that I think really make it clear just how interconnected these regions are. Um, and I think, the, from my perspective being based in the Gulf, one of the most striking things to me is just how much uh, the Arab uprisings and the, the events of the last four years really have shook to the core the way that I think the people in the Gulf are thinking about their own position. Um, many of these sort of paradigms and ideas, as Jane said, about sort of the way that, that the monarchies function, they have been shifted and turned upside down. And that doesn't mean that the monarchies are out, but I, I think, like she said, I would, I would echo that there really is a change in the way that people are thinking about what their government should be and how their relationship to the government should be. Um, so again, I would just emphasize that the Gulf region, while apparently much more stable than the rest of, um, than many other situations in the Middle East, is certainly also undergoing a very wide and very interconnected change. Um, I think the other uh, point that really strikes a chord with me, and, and maybe it's because I'm, I'm also a, a younger person in the region, is the generational gap, the generational change within the Gulf is really something that's very striking. Um, if you look at a country uh, like uh, the UAE where I live, um, you have grandparents that sit down with their grandchildren. The grandparents, maybe they were living in a country that had, uh, you know, a few, only a few paved roads. They were working, you know, sometimes manually. The children are growing up with domestic servants, with, um, you know, iPhones, with access to anything in the world. And this generational divide is having, I think, a very interesting impact on the way that the society itself conceives of, of the way forward. Um, this is such rapid change. And the social dynamic is very much still sort of catching up with the extent of economic development. Um, I would say most uh, particularly of interest to me is the, how governments will tackle the challenge of the youth bulge and finding not just jobs for the many young people who will be entering the job market in the Gulf, but jobs that will be meaningful. Um, this is a population that's increasingly educated and has high demands for what they will be doing with their own lives. So it's not just you can throw someone in the public sector anymore, give them a nice salary, and they're going to be happy. This is a generation that, like I think this generation across the world, actually wants to contribute and build. And this is a message that I think hasn't really been uh, taken up yet in the Gulf. I don't see really a solution to this issue, a way to direct the energy of this young generation into something that's very constructive. Uh, unfortunately, I think that that has one of the negative side effects is that groups like ISIS can actually prey on this, on this boredom, on this sort of lack of direction. Um, and, and this is sort of one of the negative consequences of this. And, and I think something that uh, really needs serious thought. So. Great, thank you very much. Uh, is there anything in Jane's talk or in the report that you take issue with that you'd like to sort of push back on? Uh, well, thank you very much, for uh, having me here with you. Um, um, I enjoyed the reading the actually the uh, uh, the report, but um, uh, I, I agree with a lot of it. But at the same time, actually, I have some issues regarding the changes in the state society relationship in the um, uh, in the Gulf. And but I will start first with the generation gap that uh, um, uh, Elizabeth um, um, uh, mentioned. Uh, and this that brings me to the case of state formation, which is actually the core of this analysis of this of this report. And the changes that are taking place within uh, uh, all the GCC countries are, uh, uh, are part of their state formation process. Um, uh, what, we have, what we have uh, witnessed in the past five years or six years in particular uh, is a clear indication that those states are remain in the state formation pr uh, process and without uh, putting this uh, within the framework of state formation, one would find it very difficult. State branding, for example, and so on, a clear indication that those states in, uh, are still and remain in a, in a, in a formation uh, uh, process. Because of that, we see this weak relationship between state and society in, uh, in the Gulf, uh, Gulf region. And we do not see uh, a bottom-up uh, you know, approach to understand 
the changes that are taking place in, um, uh, in, the, in, in, uh, uh, in the Gulf. And what um, um, uh, Jane have discussed regarding the political reform uh, and the changes that are taking place since 2011 uh, are due to uh, many different factors. But for me, the, the most important one is the lack of political culture. I agree with you that there will be a change, that the GCC countries, most of them, will face gradual uh, uh, political uh, reform, also economic reform. Uh, however, the question that we have to ask first, uh, is there a political culture uh, in this generation gap that you talked to, Elizabeth, is that because there is a, a generation that still know little about constitution, what is constitution? Or, for example, if we talk about a federal state like the UAE, if you ask the people what is what is a federal state, uh, so people have little understanding uh, or have a, a limited political culture that allow them to engage at different level uh, with the state when it comes to uh, to, to political uh, political uh, uh, reform and change, and that is that's what you talked about political mobilization. There will be no revolution maybe in the, in the Gulf, but there will be gradual um, uh, reform. Uh, and I agree with you that uh, uh, that this reform will will happen, but will have a very very slow base. Uh, uh, and I I, I am uh, um, and that uh, and I want to stress the fact that uh, uh, that not all the GCC countries are the same when it comes to political um, uh, to, to political reform. Some countries, maybe like Kuwait or Bahrain, have mo uh, uh, have a um, uh, little bit more political culture or politically matured. Uh, more than uh, UAE or, or Oman or Saudi Arabia when it comes to, uh, to our understanding, to modern understanding of uh, state and, 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 and political changes. Um, uh, and one of the interesting things that I've uh, stuck me actually in this uh, report is that the more I study the Gulf, um, uh, the more I realize that there are a lot of differences between these countries. And I always uh, uh, disagreed when it comes to that, okay, we have to, when we examine this region, we have to say GCC. Um, I, I think there are great differences uh, emerging uh, between these, these, uh, these countries. Uh, and in particular, if we divide them into two or, uh, two or three groups, you have UAE and Qatar, they have maybe some similarities, Oman and, and, and Saudi Arabia because of the geographic size. Uh, uh, and then we have Bahrain and, and Kuwait because of the similarities that they have more political, uh, they are more politically mature to, uh, to some extent. So the, the, uh, I think we have also to, to, to bear in mind that uh, when we examine the region, we have to make the differences. I think you made some very gener uh, generalization, which actually uh, might not be fair for some of the GCC countries, you know, when it comes to, to, uh, to uh, political uh, change. In Kuwait, for example, we see that the society has been very active since the, 19, uh, since the 1960s, and they have contributed significantly in the development of this political, uh, political system, unlike other uh, states. We cannot compare it to United Arab Emirates or Qatar uh, or uh, Saudi Arabia. And one main issue, just to, to bring up on this, is the international allies that you have uh, allies uh, uh, um, and the GCC. I think one of the main determinants of the foreign policies of the UK and the US in particular toward the Middle East uh, uh, is their relation with the, uh, with the Gulf countries. Uh, so uh, uh, UK and the US for so many years have been relying on their uh, strong relations with the GCC countries. And nowadays is a clear example that UK, for example, having uh, uh, a military base in, in, in Bahrain indicates clearly that without the GCC country, they will not be able to serve or to, uh, the, to, uh, to, uh, to meet the objectives of the, of the, of the, foreign, of the foreign policy in, in, the, uh, in, the, in, in the Middle East. And, and, and also, this uh, uh, applies to the, to the US. And the US, they need some basis. They need uh, support for their uh, commitment toward the region. And the Gulf is the only stable uh, place in the Middle East which helps them and facilitates facilitate the, the, uh, uh, um, uh, um, the, the, their commitment and or relations with the, um, uh, with the Middle East. And I'll stop here. Great, thank you very much indeed. Um, what I'll do now is turn the floor to questions. We've got about 20 minutes just to sort of um, grill Jane as best as we can and to also put questions to, to my colleagues here. Um, there are two roving mics somewhere going around the room. If I could ask you to stand up 
when you speak, if you can identify yourself and your institution, that would be much appreciated. So um, this gentleman over here, thank you very much. Um, thank you, everyone, for a really enlightening um, talk, and I really look forward to reading the report. Um, question primarily to Khalid. Um, everyone else, obviously, welcome to contribute. Um, I agree that there are um, big sorry, differences. Sorry, could you introduce yourself? Oh, sorry, yeah, Sam Wilkin from Reuters. Thank you. Um, I agree there are big differences between the GCC countries, um, but equally, after a sort of brief split last year, politically speaking, they seem to be very tightly knit again um, in the face of external threats. Um, so to what extent do you think developments in one country will sort of add pressure to the others? So if one were to introduce a legislative assembly, would others start to feel the pressure on that or could they sort of evolve in separate ways? Thank you. Don't say that one. Yeah, uh, well, thank you very much. Um, uh, I agree with you that, uh, you know, if one country in the GCC um, uh, uh, have any political or major political reform might have effect over other uh, GCC countries. But what if we see in the past 40 years in the, in the region, uh, in, the, in the Gulf, uh, since 1980s in particular, um, that whatever Saudi Arabia does, other GCC countries follow. But that has not been the case uh, since uh, 2000 because if we see the, the GCC integration itself, the GCC, uh, this regional organization, we see that those states have agreed to come to an agreement regarding few elements when it comes to any changes. But one of the uh, most interesting uh, uh, aspects of this and related to this question is that what happened in Qatar. Uh, the changes in the leadership, the peaceful transition of leadership, uh, uh, would have actually, uh, many have thought that it will have an implication over the other GCC countries, but it didn't. Because of that, because, because of this particular incident, uh, nobody will th think that in the coming years, any changes within the uh, GCC countries will affect over other uh, smaller countries. Even if Saudi Arabia uh, decided to uh, uh, abolish the sponsorship system, for example because there are differences between this, and there, there, there are actually even uh, uh, particularities about each in the country. If you look at Oman and UAE, there you see, uh, you'll see great differences. So I do not think that uh, there will be any um, uh, differences uh, also or, or uh, effects of any small change, or small change of what one country or, uh, will happen over the other one. Excellent, thank you. Did you want to take anything about that? Yes, please. It's gentleman Tan. My name is Hosni Imam. I'm a member of the Institute. Uh, thank you, Jim, for uh, a very serious uh, research and uh, deep insight into uh, the region. But uh, there are certain undertones uh, that come up uh, when one just uh, hears your uh, presentation today. Uh, is it another window of change of Harold Macmillan? Is it another Kundalisa Rice uh, speech in the American University about the creative chaos? Uh, I feel this yeah. is a very serious uh, Western research um, done for Western audience. Um, and if you talk to people in the Gulf or in the region about it, mm. again, they will tell you you got it wrong in many ways, uh, with respect. And you, you, I don't know if you have um, tackled the external threats facing mm. the Gulf. Uh, that would also affect the mm. domestic policy yes. and uh, the, what you call uh, uh, the relation between all the new and uh, the globalization and all this. So all these are very serious issues mm. that um, um, need to be uh, taken into consideration and seen in perspective of a Western <coughs> analysis, uh, as we would say in the Middle East, uh, by Khawaga, into an Arab issues. Mm. And Absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm writing as an outside observer, but observing changes that I think are taking place in the Gulf rather than changes that are coming through Western policies. The legacy of that kind of talk about a creative chaos, a new Middle East democracy through regime change, I think has, has really debased the idea of democracy in the minds of a lot of people. And although the Arab uprisings initially 
were seen by some people in the Gulf as something that would uh, encourage them to make their own demands. I think the subsequent conflicts and the, the threat of state collapse has reinforced a more politically conservative camp and made a lot of people feel we don't want radical change because it's, it's something that is, is too risky. Um, the external threats clearly play a role there and in one of the chapters I focus more on the, the regional environment and the, the concerns about state failure, the concerns about Iran and so forth. But I think although probably most of the population doesn't want a revolution and many segments of society don't want democracy, again and again you hear from people a desire that their views and their social groups should have more of a say. And it's interesting, if we look at Bahrain, for example, uh, there was a strong movement against the uprising, uh, which was saying, we, we support the monarchy, we want to be part of, you know, we, 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 we welcome the GCC forces coming in, and so forth. But those groups also have their demands when it comes to corruption, the justice system, things like this. They might not want democracy, but they have actually become more politically mobilised and I think one of the challenges for the Gulf countries is how do you accommodate these very disparate demands? Uh, how do you have a, a more pluralistic system that allows them to have a say within the system rather than necessarily taking to the streets and practicing politics in a more chaotic way? That's how I think I would look at it if I was in the seat of someone in the GCC government. We just also add, we talked a lot to people in governments uh, during... The, the research for this, and I think there are some very different views, uh, but that there is an awareness that the population is very young, that they need to be, they need to find new ways of taking these people on board. A lot of officials are listening more to the social media, um, but sometimes those in power are worried about how you can open up without risking everything. And I guess that's where the report is trying to suggest some ways of doing it in a more consensual way. Excellent. Thank you. Further questions? The gentleman at the back, that's great, thank you. Uh, Matthew Howard from Petrofac. The, um, the low, you could argue the low oil price we're seeing at the moment is kind of a, gives an opportunity to, to move a bit quicker on some of the issues you raise in your report. Do you, I mean, you know, the, the need to sort of diversify the economy and I just wonder whether if, if that is an opportunity to make some of these changes quicker, can the establishment, you know, re react in, in, a, in a time frame of a few years, let's say, if the oil price were to stay low for a, for a couple of years or is that, can it just simply not react that fast? I'll give you an example from Oman because it's the country that is really uh, facing the biggest fiscal squeeze at the moment. I visited in, in January and talking to economic planners and policy makers, you would hear some of them say, actually, this moment, this low oil price is a wake up call. It should remind us that we need to get on with diversifying uh, more seriously. But Every time they announce anything controversial to do with fiscal reform, there's just enough political space for people to go on Twitter and say, no, we don't want tax and we don't want a freeze in public sector hiring or something like this. And so for political reasons, then the government is very reluctant uh, to, to push anything through that might result in, that might involve budget cuts and might be unpopular. Uh, you have similar issues in, in Kuwait, where the parliament is always resisting any attempt at economic reform. Uh, and I think there, there is more of a need for allowing space for a loyal opposition that can actually contribute to some of the debates. At the moment, especially where the opposition movements are just squeezed out and have no chance to participate, it's very easy for them to just make incredibly unrealistic demands and you don't get many good uh, economic policy ideas coming out of many of the opposition movements, for example. So the IMF, for instance, was advocating recently that, that Kuwait, to have fiscal reform, it needs more of a political compact 
the opposition's currently outside the parliament. Maybe at the next election that could change, but there needs to be a bit more actually burden sharing um, because otherwise there's going to be a lot of uh, blame game and infighting and rows. Jane, if I could just put one question to you. Um, I, I think it's, it's at, at, towards the end of your recommendations at the back, and you say that the US and UK underestimate the significant mm. leverage that they have in the Gulf. I find that a little bit uh, bemusing. Could you perhaps elaborate upon that, um, particularly re with reference to the comment we, we had earlier about the undertones? I just, I just wonder what you meant by that. I think that we often hear from diplomats that Western leverage is, is less than it used to be, and certainly it's less than it used to be. It's got to be less than during the colonial period, mm. and that's a, a good thing. Um, but I think the, the, there is still a great deal of Western influence at hard level in terms of the security cooperation, pr primarily from the US, but also with Britain and France, and that there's also a lot of Western soft power in terms of uh, pers close personal relationships between the elites. And so while Western governments, I think it's an issue across the whole region actually, that Western governments look at themselves and say, we don't have that much power. Actually, people in the region will often blame them for things. Mm -hmm. And so you find, speaking to critics of the governments in the Gulf, that they, they don't see America as a force that's trying to bring them democracy. They see Western policies as reinforcing the existing elites. Okay, thank you. Yes, please, take the question down at the front. Thank you. Hi, my name is Soher Solomon. I'm an editor for Foreign Affairs. Um, you touch on several Arab countries in the Gulf, but you avoided to speak about Qatar, which is playing a very opposite rules to any of the Arab countries. Um, do you think the wind of democracy would reach Qatar soon so we can see change on the highlight of uh, helping ISIL? Thank you. So you're asking about democracy, but also whether it would change their foreign policy? Yeah, we can see change. So, I'll... I'll say two things about that. Firstly, I think that they've had, they haven't had much in terms of local demands for elections. They promised elections. I think I first visited in 2004 and the Prime Minister said we'll have parliamentary elections next year and still those haven't taken place. There hasn't been much of an adverse reaction within Qatar, probably partly because they've become so rich over the same period that that makes many people quite satisfied with the status quo. But when it comes to foreign policy, I think there has been some domestic criticism because for, uh, if you take a, a young Qatari, maybe they're quite well off, they get to travel a lot. If they come to the UK 10 years ago, they would say Qatar, people would say what? Then maybe people would say, oh, is that in Dubai? And then maybe five years ago, people would say, oh yeah, Al Jazeera. And then more recently, oh, you've got the World Cup. And now Qataris do say that when they travel abroad, people often associate Qatar with allegations about financing terrorism, support for the Muslim Brotherhood, things like this. The Qatari government obviously denies these things, and there has been, for instance, a recent report by the French government saying these allegations are really, really overblown. But I think there is some sense there that they don't, they don't want to be seen as permanently the odd one out in the GCC, and they certainly don't want to be seen as fueling instability. Elizabeth, did you want to Thank you. come in sure, on that? Sure, no, I would just, um, I, I would just share one uh, short example, actually, of, um, I thought, a really interesting way that uh, domestic feedback played into the foreign policy, uh, particularly on the split that happened within the GCC um, and the withdrawal of the ambassadors from Qatar. Um, I heard at the time many Qataris actually very frustrated with this because they said, look, I have cousins who are Emirati, I have, you know, my, my sister is married to a Saudi and this is really causing problems for me. Um, it was causing a lot of sort of social tension, you know, there were Twitter wars between Emiratis and Qataris, it got really nasty. And I think that the, the Qatari government at some point actually did hear this frustration and I think that it very much was part of what encouraged them to sort of uh, 
for all the sides to sort of come back together. So I think there is, you know, a, a growing understanding that sometimes, you know, that, that, that there does need to be citizen input on some of these things. Can I draw you in on this, Khaled, as an Emirati who's, who teaches at the Qatar University, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I think uh, um, um, uh, there is no demand from the Qataris towards, you know, political reform, um, a genuine political reform in Qatar because of the small minority of the population. So it's very difficult to judge on, on the, if you look at the domestic politics of Qatar, that there is a demand or there is uh, uh, pressure from within the society toward the government to reform its political system. So I, I would I'd agree with, with Jane on that aspect. But there is pressure from the, uh, the society toward its foreign policy. And this is what Elizabeth also have uh, uh, echoed. Um, uh, since uh, the rise of Qatar you know, as an active player until now, Many have said, well, uh, Qatar uh, foreign policy is a clear reflection of its domestic politics, which, uh, uh, in fact, it's not. Because uh, if Qatar supports the Islamists, uh, that doesn't mean, actually, uh, the society is, as a, you know, is an Islamist or, so, or a Muslim Brotherhood. Because Muslim Brotherhood is just uh, a tool in Qatar's foreign policy. The society itself does not believe in, in, in Muslim uh, Brotherhood. And there is a, a very tiny fraction of the society that actually uh, supports this ideo ideology. If not, uh, there may be very few, uh, uh, few, few, few people. So there, there are actually uh, pressure from within, within the society toward the government to change its foreign policy, especially towards neighboring countries. Because as Elizabeth said, and I tell you that um, from UAE, I know that more than, if I say, I would say 40% or 50% of the Qatari society have relatives in the UAE. So uh, there is a strong social relationship between UAE and Qatar, and therefore the society would like to see a better relation within the GCC uh, itself, but also at the regional level, because all Qataris who travel nowadays abroad, they started to face some difficulties, and, and they started to put pressure on the, on the, on the government. But I think uh, it's changing uh, slowly. Excellent, thank you. We're running out of time, so I'm going to take two questions, and that'll be the final two. There's a question down here, this gentleman. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello, uh, my name's Keith Nottall. I'm from um, Birkbeck, University of London, and in my past life I lived in, the, uh, in Dubai and in Sharjah, in fact, in the private sector, not the oil sector like Petrofac. Um, my question is this. There was an article in the Chatham House House magazine a couple of weeks ago about world cities. Would the panel agree that Dubai, which... I'm hearing about Qatar, but of course it was Dubai that set the trend for sports events, for the airline, for the ports, for the economic diversification, which has happened in the UAE far, to a far greater extent than anywhere else. So do the panel feel that that is going to be the trend, that Dubai will continue? Dubai 2020, of course, is the big watchword now. Um, is Dubai going to be the new big world centre? Will that continue, or will their big brothers down the road um, curtail Thank you very much. If I could take your question, sir. Abdul Khaliq Ali, Kuwait yeah. Oil Company. Uh, I think the panel agreed that change is coming in GCC, albeit slow. Um, but change is a very broad terminology. Do you have an idea in which direction is going this change? Um, given the different political and historical differences between the Gulf countries, would this change have a domino effect? Um, in which direction it's going. So I would like really if you can elaborate on this. Thank, Thank you, you very much. And there was one last question. Yes, please. Yes, I'm uh, Abdullah Ba'aboud from Qatar University. Uh, I'm the director of Gulf Studies, Qatar University. I also want to thank uh, Chatham House for such a balanced report. I think this is not a Western uh, view of thing, how things go uh, in the Gulf. I am from the Gulf, I studied in the Gulf, I teach in the Gulf, and uh, this is how people uh, uh, feel about what is going on. So uh, despite you know, some accusation that this is a Western uh, uh, way of looking at things, I think the people in the Gulf are also humans. They have aspirations. There is a very young population, as you uh, said in the, uh, in the report. They're looking for more freedom, more participation, uh, better life than what it, what it is now. So I just wanted to congratulate you for uh, such a wonderful balanced report. I think you've touched on a number of very, very important issues. I think 
change is, is bound to happen. There is a lot of young people who are demanding uh, their rights. Most of them have studied abroad. This young generation that is now going to be the leaders in business or, or academia or, or, or government, um, have, uh, they were, most of them were born after the 1970s. Uh, and so they haven't seen the old days that you know, their fathers, and they're not content uh, with, uh, with the situation. So I think change is going to happen. Another driver for change is, of course, the, uh, the Sorry, media. Abdullah, could you pose your question, please? A question, yeah. yes. Uh, a question is, uh, in the report, you mentioned that, uh, uh, that the, uh, Europe and the Western allies in the United States should look at uh, the, the Gulf, not in an isolation of the Arab world. And I totally support that. Unfortunately, Western policies have tried to defragment the region. And I'm talking here about the EU policies towards the Arab world. There is no EU Arab policy, as you know. There is an EU Mediterranean policy, there is an EU GCC policy, there is an EU Iran policy, and there is an EU Iraq policy, and then there is an EU Somalia policy. When is it time that the EU could start thinking that there is an area that is very well connected and it makes a lot of sense that they can talk to these groups uh, as one un uh, unit. Of course, you can have different policies, but under an overarching uh, uh, policy for the whole region. Great. Thank, Thank you. you very much. So what, what I'll do is, because we've got about three minutes left, if I can ask Khaled to take um, the questions that he wants to on those, particularly on the, on, I guess, on the the world cities and perhaps a direction of change. The same with Elizabeth and then Jane, if you could just sort of wrap everything up beautifully and then finish just after two o'clock, that would be brilliant. Yeah. Um, uh, the question on Dubai. Um, uh, I think Dubai, Dubai's model will remain uh, the, the only successful example in the region. Uh, and, and because of that, we see other uh, GCC countries following more or less similar policies uh, or direction that uh, Dubai have done in the past uh, 30 or 40 years. But the changes that happening within Dubai itself, the, the financial crisis and the bailout from Abu Dhabi uh, start, uh, made uh, Dubai a little bit integrate into the uh, UAE as a whole, as, as one entity, because Dubai have always acted individually when it comes to its economic policies. Uh, nowadays, when, because of its federal nature of the Emirates, the question now, will other GCC countries, other cities within the, within the GCC can act, each city individually, uh, uh, and have um, uh, a, a, uh, a city that can have a, di a diversified um, uh, economy? Doha, for example, is learning from Dubai, but trying to take different paths, not following Dubai's example of having media city or edu you know, education city uh, and, uh, and so on. Uh, the question now uh, is that uh, because Dubai uh, had little oil, uh, can other GCC countries um, uh, follow the example without the oil, even if they have uh, uh, oil and gas revenue? And I think uh, maybe uh, Doha uh, uh, in, in particular might follow the similar uh, path, uh, um, um, uh, not uh, Bahrain or Saudi Arabia um, uh, and Kuwait because of the differences between uh, these countries, especially when it comes, for example, the, uh, not opening up uh, toward the world economy or integrating into the world economy because that's what, uh, what makes Dubai different from other GCC uh, countries. It's uh, integration into the world. Uh, Thank you very much. Let's go. Um, I would, the question about sort of how reform might happen, um, I think that to me the way that it, it, a good analogy might be as you're sort of walking into the, into the ocean and you walk just to the point where you can't touch the bottom anymore and then you go back a little bit. I think this is exactly how the reform will be. You push it just to the point you realize, okay, push too far, pull back a little bit. So uh, 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 one example of this uh, for, uh, would be um, uh, in Oman, for example, there were some serious, actually, reforms that were made in terms of uh, anti-corruption, and some very serious moves were taken against people who were alleged to be corrupt. Um, it, these things really impressed a lot of people. It really sort of shook things up. They pushed it to a point, though, however, when it started to walk back a little bit. So at the end of the day, some of the steps that were taken were actually not as impressive as they initially appeared. And so the point being that you, know, you push until you realize that maybe, OK, enough for now. Let's take it back a little bit and so, sort of two steps forward, one steps back type um, 
approach. Um, you know, I would just, uh, uh, Dr. Babur, it's good to see you um, on the question about the integrated regional policy. Um, I, I think that, you know, my own perspective as an American is that I think it's wishful thinking to think that the Americans have this sort of strategic capacity at the moment to think about the region in this way. But I think that this actually presents an opportunity for the Gulf countries to which do, many of, several of which really do see the region in a more integrated and, and, and whole context to really step forward. And I think you see several states doing this. You can agree with the policy or disagree, but I think this is very much what Qatar did at the beginning of the Arab uprisings. I think it's what the Sultan of Oman did when he tried to facilitate the talks with Iran. I think it's what Saudi Arabia and the UAE are doing by being so active in the coalition against ISIS. Um, I think they have come forward with a very different vision for the region, and in many ways, the sort of the the, the lack of, of a coherent sort of regional Western policy has allowed that to happen. Thank you, Jane. You've got two minutes just to sort of pull the whole thing together. Dubai certainly has inspired uh, other Gulf countries and others in the Arab world in terms of economic diversification, the prestige projects you mentioned, but also the more nitty gritty of successfully di diversifying infrastructure. Where it isn't so much of a model for most of the Gulf countries is the immigration model. Most of them don't want their citizens to be such a small minority. They will need to follow a somewhat different economic path. I think the political path will also be quite different in both countries. Given the short time, I will say there's much more on that in the report. Every chapter has a section called How Will Things Change that lays out some possibilities and some different scenarios. But I do think that there will be increasing political diversity within the Gulf in the coming years. Thanks very much to all of you. That's great.